All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's get started. So today we are going to talk about efficient ML.AI Lecture 9, Knowledge Distillation. So this is a new chapter after we have talked about uh, pruning, quantization, uh, neural architecture search. Now it's uh, another technique about knowledge distillation. So make sure you have uh, uh, done, uh, finished the homework one and already working on lab two, just a reminder. So today we'll learn about uh, knowledge distillation, which is orthogonal technique compared with pruning and quantization. Uh, we'll talk about what is knowledge distillation, what is teacher model, what is a student model, and also how do you match the logistics or the weights or the activations or the gradients, whatever, how to match teacher and student. We also talk about self and online distillation and also distillation for different tasks. And finally, we'll talk about another technique, uh, network augmentation. Okay, so let's get started. So what's the limitation, motivation here? Again, we have limited hardware resources across uh, different platforms. In the cloud, GPUs are super expensive and the memory capacity is also limited, 80 gigabytes, 100 gigab uh, 120, 8 gigabytes, et cetera. Uh, not to mention the, the mobile devices, uh, microcontrollers, you have uh, a, a couple of hundred kilobytes of memory versus tons of gigabytes of memory. So um, compared with the neural network, neural network on the, on the GPUs, we can run uh, ResNet, we can run VIT, um, tiny ML, we can run MCUNet, MobileNet V2 Tiny. So the question is, how do we train these tiny models okay, that can fit very little memory budget or even comparable or even match the accuracy of those larger models? So that's for tiny ML. And even for the cloud use case, even for the cloud AI, these days, large language models are getting super big, super big. And we want to reduce the serving cost. Therefore, even on the cloud, knowledge distillation makes a lot of sense. We want to, can we distill a 70 billion parameter model to a 7 billion parameter model, right? So we can save 10x uh, the memory traffic for, for the weights. So that's the question we want to answer. Can we use a larger model to guide a, a smaller model? Okay, so we have a larger model, a teacher model on the left. We have a smaller model, a student model on the right. Now, evenly training these models uh, intuitively, we can have very different accuracy, like eighty-two percent versus only fifty-two percent, right? And how the question is, um, can we help the training of tiny models with the help of these larger models? Okay, so uh, this image is the illustration of knowledge distillation. Okay, first of all, we share the same input. Okay, the same input is fed to both a larger teacher network and a student network. The teacher network usually is usually larger, like Lama to a 70B. Okay? And the student model would be is really smaller, like the um, Lama to like 70B. Okay? And then given the input, they, give, they both uh, produce some prediction logics. Okay? Logic one, logic two. Okay? And when we are training the student network, we usually have some loss, either uh, classification loss, maybe the, this is the most popular. So what is new here? We also add a new loss called distillation loss, okay? Distillation loss between teacher's logics and the student logics, okay? So what we are trying to do here is trying to match the logics of the teacher and of the students. Okay, trying to match the teacher with the students. So that's a new loss term we added here. And what's the intuition adding this loss? So if we look deeper into the prediction, given the same input image, say a cat here, uh, the teacher network, um, the two logics, one for the class cat, one for the class dog. Okay, logic for the cat is five, dog is one meaning that he thinks um, it is a cat, uh, strongly believe this is a cat. And if we normalize them um, after softmax, the probability is 98% versus 1.7%. Okay, So the teacher model strongly believe this is a cat. Versus the student network, the logic is three and two. Okay, If we do the softmax, the probability is 73%, 
versus 26%. Okay? The classification is still correct. So you don't have any loss coming from the cross entropy, cross entropy loss. Right? So ent entropy loss is zero because the prediction is correct. It's a cat. But you can tell their output from the teacher versus the student, they are also quite different. The teacher is more uh, certain this is a cat, so we have a higher probability versus the student model is less certain, only 70% uh, um, possibility, okay? So here we are trying to match the, prob um, the prediction probabilities between the teacher and the student. That's the, that's the missing part from the cross entropy loss. So how did we derive this probability? So that was through the softmax function. Uh, that's a review of uh, the softmax exponent of five divided by the exponent five plus exponent and the exp of one, right? And similarly, we can calculate the other class versus the student model is less confident. So our goal is to bump up the probability for the cat and bump down the probability for the dog to match that of the teacher. So how do we do that? Let's first uh, learn this concept called temperature. Okay? Temperature. So in the softmax, uh, if the temperature is one, that's our original case. If the temperature is larger, then the output distribution, the probability gets smoother. Uh, rather than 98, uh, 1.7, this is 60%, this is 41, 40.1%. Okay, so a larger temperature will smooth the output probability distribution. So mathematically, where does the T, temperature T appear? So appear in the denominator of the softmax, okay? For example, when we apply a temperature of 10 previously, exp5, now it becomes exp5 divided by 10. And similarly here, on the denominator is divided by 10. So this is the formal definition of knowledge distillation. Okay, so uh, neural networks typically use softmax function to generate the logics uh, to class probabilities, which is um, for, for different class with a different temperature, uh, the probability is exp z, uh, for a particular object, uh, for a particular index divided by the sum of the exp, okay? um, and ij ranges from c, uh, zero to c minus one, where you have z classes, and t is the temperature, which is usually set to one. And the goal of knowledge distillation is to align the class probability distribution between the teacher and the student network. So. Uh, we are trying to align uh, this probability distribution. So what can we align? Okay, what to match? What tensors can we match? So here we summarized a bunch of ideas where we can match. So it is primarily um, so the summary uh, we get. So let's go through them one by one, starting from the output logics. Okay, so uh, we have seen this figure, not only do we have the classification laws, but also we try to match the logics between the teacher model and the student model. We're trying to match uh, the output logics, cats and dog, as the output uh, prediction. Okay, so how do we match them? We can either use the cross entropy laws, we have two distributions, uh, one for the teacher, PT, one for the student, PS, we can also do the simple L2 loss, um, PS, uh, PT minus PS. So that's very simple, just to match the output logics. Okay. What else can we match? Not only the output, we can also try to match the intermediate tensors, including the intermediate weights and also the intermediate features. Okay, so let's look at them one by one. Here, we no longer have the output, matching the output. Now we are matching the intermediate tensors. Okay? So uh, the teacher model layer two, this is the student models layer two. Okay? So here we try to match the intermediate weights 
useful layers to try to match the weight. What is the challenge here? Matching the weight of the student versus the teacher. Remember the question of the last idea? Yes, you got it. Right. So typically, is the teacher model and the student model, their weight dimension is different, right? Teacher model is really larger. The weight tensor has larger dimension. Student model is really smaller dimension. Right? So what we can do here, just like I proposed, we can do a low rank approximation, right? And here we also, we can also do a learner projection, right? learn a, a one by one convolution here that can map uh, the student's smaller tensor to a teacher's larger, uh, larger tensor, right? So this is the teacher network, which is larger, wider. This is the uh, student model, which is narrow, narrower, smaller, okay? And we try to uh, match them by using this projection matrix, this blue matrix, uh, project from a smaller channel to a larger channel. And we can learn this projection matrix. matrix. And then we can match the output of the, after this projection matrix with the teacher model, okay? So between the teacher weight and the student weight um, plus a um, transformation matrix. So here, the blue part is the transformation matrix, which is a, just a simple FC layer uh, to align the shape, the dimension of the teacher versus the student weight. Okay. Um, there are also other methods, like you can use a low rank to, to match. And we are going to skip that here. We can also match the intermediate features, not only the weights, but also the features, the activations. So previously we were matching the weights. Now we are matching uh, these activations to match the intermediate feature maps between the teacher model and the student model. Um, the intuition is that they should teacher and student network should have similar uh, feature distribution, not just the very end as an extreme case, not just the very, very end, not just the output probability distribution, but also uh, across all the layer, different places, uh, the feature map should match. So we talk about weight matching, activation matching, what is that? Gradient matching, right? So we can also try to match the gradient from the teacher and student. Uh, let's brainstorm a little bit. They, they are of different dimension, right? So naively matching the teacher and student gradient may not work. So beyond the weight gradient, there's also the activation gradient, right? During back propagation, back, uh, the back pro propagation part is really 2x lower than the forward part because uh, it's doubling the computation. One is computing the weight gradient, the other is computing the activation gradient. If weight gradient is hard to match, can match the activation gradient. In particular, the activation gradient for the very first layer, for the input, since teacher and student, they are sharing the same input. So uh, this is intermediate attention uh, map. Uh, matching the intermediate tension map. We back propagate the gradient all the way to the to the input, to the input image. Okay? So this is the input image, and this is the gradient when we are back propagating the gradient from the output all the way to the input. And this is the gradient on the input tensor. So a tension of a senior feature map is defined as part of loss over part of X, now it's the learning objective. And what does it mean for the input feature map? So if the gradient is large, like here in the nose, in the eyes, in the face of this fox, it means that just a small perturbation in this pixel, in this area, okay, will significantly input, impact the final output. Meaning that this area is very important, very crucial for us to make a decision what it is. And indeed, it makes sense. At position ij, uh, the attention over there is defined as the gradient with respect to that pixel. And what we are trying to match is 
this attention map from the teacher versus from the student. They can be e easily matched because their dimension is the same. The gradient dimension is the same as the image. And both the teacher and student are sharing the same image, so they can match them. And let's see, um, given different networks, what does the gradient look like? So this is uh, the second row is raised at 34, third row is raised at 101, they are of the same family, versus the first row is network in network, that's a different family. Um, we can see that networks of a similar family, like third row and the second row, uh, their gradient is very similar. Well, compared with the first row, the gradient differs a lot. So here, these two differ a lot, well, these two are very similar. So attention, attention map of these performant image net models, both above 70% are indeed similar, but less performant model, this one is only 62%, has quite different future map. Therefore, when we are just doing the distillation, uh, we try to match those intermediate feature maps uh, DL over DX, trying to match the gradient with respect to the activation. Okay, any questions so far? We talked about matching the weight, uh, matching the feature, matching the gradient, also matching the output. Okay, we can also match the sparsity pattern. Okay, so how do we match sparsity pattern? Well, first of all, where does sparsity come from? So usually we have a ReLU activation function. If we have a ReLU activation function, then there is sparsity. Okay, so we wanna uh, match the sparsity pattern after the ReLU activation function. Uh, neuron is activated if it is larger than zero. If it is, if it is not activated, uh, then it becomes zero. And if it's smaller than zero, it becomes zero. So at every feature map, we try to match um, the teacher's sparsity pattern versus the student's sparsity pattern. We can also match the relation, relational information. Okay, what does that mean? Previously, uh, we have been looking at each tensor, at the output tensor, the um, uh, gradient tensor, the weight tensor, et cetera. Now we want to look at two tensors, not just one tensor, not just one, match one tensor, but two tensors. For example, uh, this is a teacher, this is a student. The teacher has 32 layers, the student has 14 layers. Okay. Um, they both have three stages. The teacher has more uh, residual modules per stage, five in the first stage versus the student has only two uh, in the first stage. Teacher has five in the second stage, student have only two in the second stage. Uh, each stage have the same resolution. And the different stage may be down sampled by two compared with the previous stage. So what we are doing here is that we can, uh, although they have different number of modules, five versus two, they also have different number of channels. The teacher model may have larger channel like 1K, here may have smaller a uh, smaller channel like five uh, like five hundred and twelve, right? Uh, but the relationship between the input of this module and the output of this module is only dependent on the number of channels, right? So, for example, here uh, we can just calculate uh, the uh, the relation between the input and the output, which is of dimension c in. Uh, times uh, C out since we did a re reduction on the sp spatial dimension okay, for both the teacher and student networks. So we can have a C in times C out tensor here for the teacher and that of uh, the same tensor for the, uh, for, the for the for the teacher and also for the student. And we are trying to match the relationship between the input and output for the teacher and the input and output for the student given a given a stage. We can also um, match the relationship not only for the different uh, 
tensors, but also for different inputs, okay, different samples. Like here we have three samples for the bird, bird one, bird two, bird three. Previously, uh, we just try to match the distance between uh, the teacher of bird one, uh, teacher of bird one versus the student of bird one, versus teacher of bird two or of the, under the student of bird two, right? So they are independent. These three birds are independent. And now we try to match um, the joint part, right? T1, T2, T3 from the teacher versus S1, S1, S3 from the student. They should um, have very similar relationship between each other. Right here, T2 is on the right of T1, S2 should be on the right of S1, okay? Versus in this loss, it doesn't care whether S2 is here or within the circle, 330 degrees, it doesn't matter. But here it matters, okay? The relationship matters. So conventional KD focuses on matching the uh, features or matching the logics on just one input, okay? The relational KD uh, looks at the relation between intermediate features across multiple inputs, okay? So this is tried on image models um, for your homework, for your open-ended projects, feel free to try this on large language models, whether it makes sense to try this relational uh, knowledge distillation across multiple inputs when you are compressing like large language model or visual language model, maybe this method can, can shed some light. Uh, so this is putting in math. So we have multiple samples. Uh, we calculate the output distance uh, between the, sample, the students, first sample, second sample, first sample, third sample, first sample, nth sample, etc. Okay. Uh, so altogether, how many terms are there? We have n times n minus one divided by two, since it's pairwise, representing this pairwise uh, distance of future vectors. So on the bottom, we compare this is individual knowledge of distillation. Okay. Uh, we just care uh, the distance between T1 and S1, T for teacher, S for student, T2 and S2, Tn and Sn, right? Now we not only care their in the, uh, the independent way, but we care the relationship between among them, right? So we have to calculate, given a, a tensor, we want to uh, go back to visit the distance with all the previous uh, input samples. So that's the difference between uh, the relation within the model calculated separately, uh, calculated separately for each input versus calculating the relation across different input samples. Okay, so that's all for the second part. What to match? Match the gradient, match the weight, match the activation, match the logits, match across different input samples, okay? So for that part, we have one teacher and one student. We require two models. What's the problem for that? Especially when the scale is larger. You have to first train a very big model, very giant model. You have to first have a teacher before you can have a student. But training this teacher could be very expensive. Like training llama, uh, 70 billion prime per llama is pretty costly, right? Then if we don't have the teacher, how do we apply knowledge distillation to begin with? So that's what we'll try to answer in the third part of this lecture, self and online distillation. Just like self-learning, we don't have a teacher. You just learn by yourself or learn together with your classmates. And for the previous distillation, we have to train it once. Okay? First, how to finish the whole training process, get a high performance, high performance teacher model, and then start a, uh, start uh, this distillation process for the student model. But now we just want to do it only once. Let's do it only once. Online distillation, you distill while you learn. Okay, so that's the opening the motivation for the third part self and online distillation. Let's see how that works. Starting with uh, self-distillation. 
So teacher model, like we mentioned, is usually larger than the student model, and that is fixed, right? We have a large fixed teacher model and a small uh, student model. Uh, the disadvantage of a fixed large teacher model um, has some disadvantage since we have to train it, uh, which is very expensive to train. And does it have to be the case we have a fixed large model in KD? Actually, not necessarily. It can be of the same size, doesn't have to be a fixed size, fixed large size. So this, this project was born, a, a born again network and this iterative training stage okay, using both the classification objective and also the distillation um, objective. So what is interesting here is that the teacher and student model size, the architecture is exactly the same. Same architecture, same model size, not bigger teacher, small student, they are the same size. Okay. Um, so what it does here is um, we first train uh, step zero using only the classification uh, cross entropy loss to train the teacher. And in the second step, we use the cross entropy loss to train the student and also try to match uh, the logics from the teacher from the previous step versus the student from the next step. And on and so on. Each time, each time, each step, we match, uh, we try to train it with the cross entropy loss versus the uh, distillation loss with the previous uh, step. We use the previous step here as the teacher to guide the next step. And as a result, um, the students S1, S2, SK, S1, S2, SK is getting better and better. When the training finishes in the last step, since uh, these architectures are the same, we can uh, ensemble the prediction uh, together. Okay, We can ensemble this uh, output together to get the final output, to ensemble this output to get even better performance. So that's the interesting part where the teacher and student, they are of the same size. We can also do online distillation. Okay, online distillation is saying that um, let's see, we have two networks, they can be the same size. Okay? Not necessarily teacher is larger than the student. Uh, they can be the same and they are trained from scratch rather than we first train the teacher model. After that train, then we do the distillation. Now we don't have a teacher. We don't have a student. Every, everybody is just starting from scratch. Uh, just like in the classroom, only you and your neighbor, your classmate. When you sit together, uh, network one is the teacher of network two when we are training network two. And network two is the teacher of network one when we are training network one. Okay, so they are acting as the teacher of each other, which is the interesting part. So just like you have uh, two models, they are of the very uh, exactly the same size. Uh, what you do here is to add the loss, not only the cross entropy loss, so here S for the student, T for teacher. We have the cross entropy loss for the student, Y is the ground truth label, and then you have the KL divergence, uh, the KD loss, knowledge distillation loss, uh, treating the second model as a teacher, first model as a student. When you're training a teacher, uh, you not only have this cross entropy loss, but you use the student model as the teacher and the teacher model as the students. Okay? So learning from each other. So the interesting part is that it's not, it's not necessary to pre-train this teacher and the student. Okay? This teacher. The teacher can be initialized, trained from scratch together with the student. And the student can be the same size as the teacher. You not necessarily need to have a larger teacher, uh, which is the interesting part here. Okay, so here, uh, when we are training uh, P1, P2 is the teacher, when we are training P2, P1 is the teacher. So people call it deep, uh, mutual learning. And we can see here on CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100 uh, data set, the deep mutual learning can improve both the student and the teacher modules. Okay, so the DML, in the middle row uh, is showing uh, the performance 
after this online distribution compared with uh, independent training. Okay. And we, we can also have a combined approach, okay? combined approach to combine the online distillation and also combine the self distillation. Okay? So here the title is Be Your Own Teacher. We don't have a separate teacher. We don't have to train the teacher from scratch. Uh, finish, have a pre-trained teacher model to guide the uh, student model, but we can train from scratch using this deep supervision plus distillation. Okay. So we we are using the deeper layers output as the teacher to distill the information for shallower layers. So the teacher and the student no longer comes from two different models, one large model, one small model, but they're coming from the same model, but different places. Uh, those deeper layers output will be the teacher for the shallower layer. So that's the beauty of this project where you don't have to maintain two copies of the weight. You just have one copy of the weight. Otherwise you have to double the GPU memory, which is expensive. You now you only have one copy of the weight and the teacher is very simple. It's just a deeper layer, a deeper layer to supervise those shallower layers. And the intuition is that the labels at a later stage are more reliable. So the author use them to supervise the predictions for the previous stages. So no teacher, you, you, you is your own teacher, but just uh, using the shallower layer, uh, using the deeper layer to supervise the shallower layer. And let's see how that works. Uh, so the first row is the baseline. Um, uh, if we uh, use the predictions from in the intermediate classifiers, uh, sometimes actually outperform the baseline, uh, which is quite interesting. And uh, this inference in efficiency can be improved because we don't have to wait until we uh, go to the last stage. Uh, maybe we can exit early uh, when the confidence is high enough. Okay, so that's all for the first three parts. We'll take a break before we talk about distillation for different tasks and talk about network augmentation. All right, welcome back. So let's continue to talk about knowledge distillation. Now we wanna apply knowledge distillation to different tasks to solve real world problems. So let's start with object detection. So what is object detection? You try to find the bonding box for different objects. You not only wanna give the uh, class what it is, but also to tell me what is the, where is the object giving the bonding box uh, for the location. Okay, so we can see uh, the distillation pipeline is more complicated here, uh, but still it include the basic uh, components, including the uh, matching, trying to match the feature, trying to match the feature map. And here we can use a one by one convolution to match the shape, just like we discussed before, the teacher model versus the student model they may, uh, they may have different dimensions. So we use this one by one convolution uh, to match the dimension so that we can subtract uh, the tensor of the same sizes. What is new here, uh, we use a, a weighted, okay, the weighted um, uh, P log P here uh, to differentiate the background versus the, the foreground. Right, so the cross entropy loss previously we have is just a P teacher uh, log P student. Okay, what is new here? We added a uh, class condition here um, to have different weight for the foreground and for the background. For the background, we can allow some difference, but for the uh, for the foreground, we really want it to be accurate. For the background, we can allow uh, some certain amount of mismatch. So that's why we have uh, a weight here to differentiate the foreground versus the background uh, classes. Well, the next part, we also want to predict the bonding box. Okay, it's not, not just a class, but it's a location. Okay, x1, y1, x2, y2, given those corners, we draw a bonding box. 
So what's new here, we can see there is an if branch. Okay? So why is the ground truth? Uh, RS is the prediction from the student. And we try to minimize this difference between the student versus the ground truth uh, versus here. If the uh, student, if the error from the student is larger than the teacher, then we apply this, uh, this loss. Otherwise, if the teacher is not as good as the student, it doesn't make sense to be a teacher, right? So at that time, uh, we assume uh, the deletion loss to be zero. Okay, so this is very interesting. We add an M term, which is a buffer, okay? So make sure the student, the loss from the student, the error from the student is larger than the teacher. The teacher is having a smaller error compared with uh, the student plus a threshold. Okay, then it can act as a teacher. Uh, otherwise, we uh, just uh, put the loss, the distillation loss to be zero. Make sure the quality of the student um, is within a threshold within the of the teacher. So there's another way uh, to guide the bounding box prediction. Okay, it used to be a regression problem because the x, y location for the object is continuous. We can also uh, convert it into a classification problem. Let's brainstorm how do we convert that into a classification problem. We can chunk the y-axis and x-axis into several bins, right? So here we have six bins on the y dimension, one, two, three, four, five, six. We can also chunk, divide the x-axis uh, to six bins. So now we have 36 uh, blocks. And uh, if the predicted uh, predicted x, y location fall into the uh, correct bin, then that's the correct prediction, okay? So that's, uh, that's converting a con continuous value into a, a discrete value. Once it's a discrete value, we can use the cross entropy loss uh, to cast it into a classification problem. Like here, we have um, 36 classes, right? And for X, we have six classes. One, two, three, four, five, six. And here, the ground truth should be the second class. And so that uh, we can use the uh, the same cross entropy loss uh, to uh, supervise this uh, this detection problem uh, for discrete locations. Now we try to match uh, the distribution of the class. So the class is basically the location location bin, right? The location bin. Uh, y axis this is bin one, bin two, three, four, five, six is a classification problem. All about semantic segmentation. So segmentation is a new task. We we'll try to find, uh, to give a label for each pixel, okay? Pixel-wise prediction, pixel-wise prediction. Again, we can have the same uh, feature uh, limitation, limitation similar to classification and detection, okay? What is new here, we can add a discriminator network to provide the adversarial loss, okay? The student is trained to fool the the discriminator uh, network. So we have a, a real embedding from the teacher teacher model with a real embedding. The student net give a uh, uh, the, the fake embedding, okay? And here we try to um, fool the, uh, the discriminator cannot distinguish between the real embedding versus the fake embedding. And we can also try to uh, encourage both um, the teacher and the student, uh, the student to grow to be uh, to be as accurate as the teacher, such that the, discri the discriminator cannot tell this is uh, fake embedding. This is from the student. They are thinking these two are as good as each other, and they cannot distinguish them from each other. Then the output given by the student should be uh, very close uh, to the to the teacher. So that's the uh, adversarial loss as the distillation. We can also use this distillation loss to compress GAN models. I use knowledge distillation for GAN model. In this work we did a couple of years ago, uh, four years ago actually, but GAN compression. So we have two models. Here we have a teacher model, here we have a student model. First, we can apply the distillation loss to this intermediate feature mass. 
you can see the teacher uh, have larger number of channels. The student have smaller amount of channels. Here we use a one by one convolution to match the channel dimension. Okay? To match the channel dimension. And next we have this uh, uh, reconstruction loss. Reconstruction loss make sure uh, even the students pixel wise to give the pixel wise um, uh, measure the pixel wise difference with the ground truth with the ground truth. And finally, the third term is the gain loss. Okay, C for condition, condition gain loss. Uh, we want to make sure the teacher and the student are close enough so that I can fool the discriminator uh, telling that these two are basically both them are real. And the training objective, uh, we add these three uh, loss, loss terms all together to supervise that. So that the small student model can perform as good as the large teacher model. So here we have a demo after compression using GAN compression. Uh, on the top is the original cycle GAN, which turns a horse into a zebra. Okay? Unfortunately, it runs very slowly. Uh, this is deployed on Jackson Xavier uh, GPU, a very small mobile GPU. Um, and you can see it's, it's very slow. Uh, flops is taking 56 giga ops, only running at 12 frames per second. FIV is 61.5. But after GAN compression, the flops reduced to only 3.5 giga ops. That's 16 times lower uh, flops. And the frames per second increased to 40. And FID also increased to 53. Uh, FID decreased to 53. Originally, it was 61. Uh, here is another demo, interactive demo, edges to shoes. We just draw these edges, and then we want to convert it into shoes. Now we want to erase the logo. We we'll try to change from Adidas to a Nike shoe and see how that works. Originally, it was pretty slow. This is running on even smaller JSON Nano. Okay, JSON Nano. And previously, it's running only 1.6 frames per second. And you can see the drawing is very difficult because it's not interactive. It runs too slowly on this edge device. Since the frame rate is so low, it can only sparsely sample a few uh, samples. And barely looks like a Nike shoe. And what, after, uh, what if we uh, apply gen compression to run the smaller model? The erase becomes much smoother. On the right hand side is the gen compression, the left hand side is the baseline. Now we try to draw another Nike shoe. Now it can run 3.9 frames per second. Okay, it's it's much smoother. Mm. On same hardware, um, the speed up is about 2.5 uh, uh, X, which is quite good. Everything is deployed locally on this uh, JSON Nano GPU. So we have a bunch of them. If you are interested in this project, feel free to talk, up, talk to us. We can uh, uh, lend you a few such mobile GPUs. OK. Uh, so we talk about vision tasks, distillation for image detection, image segmentation for image generation. Let's now talk about KD, knowledge distillation for natural language. So uh, in natural language, we are going to cover that later. Uh, the attention is the very important base building one. Then we have a, a projection for QKV, attention, and the output projection, feed forward, uh, a couple of layer, norm, la uh, layer norms. So what we can try to match is not only the feature map, okay, not only the feature map, but also the attention map, okay, which is our O-N square. So this is showing, matching the attention map. What does it look like? So this is the feature, the first row. Um, the, 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 the attention map is always a square because it's all n, uh, n by n, number of token times the number of token. And this is the student with attention transfer versus without attention transfer. With attention transfer, the attention map is very similar versus without, very different. These two are very similar versus this is quite different. Okay, so in addition to feature imitation, 
the uh, transformer architecture give us another opportunity to try to match the attention maps. And knowledge distillation for large language model and also visual language models. Okay, so Prudian and distillation can work together showing this work okay, to obtain much smaller large language models. So here is the cost of training the model measured in uh, trillion tokens. For example, Lama 2AB here, they use 15 trillion tokens. Uh, this JMA 7B 2.5 tokens. And here we can reduce uh, the number of token trading tokens by a large margin while maintaining the accuracy compared with the trading from scratch to be much more free. A, B, I have uh, able to have 40 times cheaper, 99% uh, uh, better accuracy on the MLU uh, score. And here is how the whole process works. So it contains, on the left-hand side, it contains a, uh, uh, the pre-training uh, data mix versus the synthetic data mix. So to train both a uh, pre-training model versus the instruction model. Okay, this is instruction two. This is the without instruction tuning using the logics coming from uh, Lama 38B and also Lama 378B. Okay, so you do a model uh, which is uh, a one B and a one B model. And the on the instruction instruction tuning data comes from the, uh, you have uh, some synthetic, you generate some prompt, passes through the Lama 3, four, four, 400 billion parameter on Lama 3 to get some synthetic data. And you concatenate that with some collective fine tuning data altogether in train this instruction model. Okay, so that's the overall pipeline. And how do we select the, the student model? We select actually, uh, this work select the student model using the pruning technique. Uh, we talked about previously uh, using the uh, to rank those important channels. Okay, so this is the uh, the work where Minitron apply uh, knowledge dissertation um, retraining after pruning the model. Okay, the student model is a pruned version of the teacher model. Okay, so usually we have a, a train pre the large language model, many layers. And then uh, Minitron basically going to estimate the importance of embedding one, two, three, four, tag one, two, three, four, and et cetera. And then it's going to rank them according to the importance and then prove away those less important channels, tokens, tags, et cetera. And then he still is uh, using this as a student and the original LLM as a teacher to he steal them. And here it can match a lot of different answers Okay, the embedding, NLP, etc. The decision not only matching the output logics, but also is trying to match those intermediate features. Okay, so we talk about distillation for different tasks, for both the region tasks and also NLP tasks. And finally, let's talk about network augmentation, another uh, piece of work very related to the software. So we try to improve the accuracy, the quality of a small model. Okay, that's the uh, central topic of this lecture. How do we improve the accuracy of small model? Um, data augmentation uh, is a very widely used, uh, very very used in training to avoid overfeeding. For example, if we have a limited amount of data, and we want to augment it, augment it such that we can, as if we have a larger amount of data. Small amount of data versus larger amount of data. So typical way of doing data augmentation for vision tasks, including cutout. For example, we cut part of the image, okay? And uh, human can still tell this is a dog. And also uh, we can mix up. For example, we are given an image, a cat and a dog. A cat given label one, zero. The first one is cat and the second one is dog. The cat has a label one zero, dog has a label zero one. We can mix them up uh, half and half, just pixel wise add them up. And then the logic would be 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. So originally we have only two images. Now we have a third image. So let's mix up. Also there's work called auto augments where uh, we can tilt it. Uh, we can tint it with different colors. We have a lot of different policies, both spatially and also in the color domain. That's called um, 
you can also use uh, auto ML to automatically find the best augmentation policy. Apart from data augmentation, another way to prevent overfitting is uh, using draw parts. So during training, we randomly select a few uh, neurons and zero them out uh, to drop them out. Also, people can do spatial drop out to uh, randomly remove a few channels and also drop block to remove a few blocks in the coarse granularity. As a result, these techniques like drop out, like data augmentation, can greatly improve these large neural networks' performance. Uh, here is the performance of Resident 50, that's 4 gigamax. And this is image that uh, top point accuracy. This is the baseline of, of about 76.5. This is after mix up, almost 78. Uh, this is after auto augment, uh, more than 77. By using drop logs, more than 78. And so for these large models, um, drop out and data augmentation really helps because large models tend to overfit. So drop out and data, data augmentation prevents overfitting. However, for tiny models, we did the same experiment. Unfortunately, both drop out and data augmentation actually hurt the accuracy. Okay? So the more we add, the more techniques we add, the less the accuracy. Okay? So adding mix up, it hurt. Adding auto elements, it hurt. Adding drop block, it hurt. Um, previously, when it helps most, now it hurts the most. And we suspect the tiny model uh, lacks the capacity, doesn't suffer from the overfitting issue, but suffer from the underfitting issue. We don't have enough capacity to learn so much knowledge uh, for the tiny network. So contrary to image augmentation, now we think about how we do network augmentation okay, to augment the model to get some extra supervision during training for the tiny model. So in the end, we still want to deploy a small tiny model like here only with two channels rather than four channels. But during the learning process, we find some redundancy helps. Uh, if you can sometimes have uh, four channels, sometimes have three channels, not just these two channels, it is helpful. For example, once you get stuck in a more local minimum, some actual dimension, some actual degree of freedom can help you uh, get away from the local minimum. And indeed, network augmentation for the tiny model, this is more than only too tiny with only 20, 23 minimax. Here we have four gigamax. Okay? So two orders of magnitude uh, difference. After adding network aug, the accuracy finally improved. So how that works? So this is the vanilla training. We have a very small model with only uh, two, two neurons. In this case, three layers, two neurons. And then we build an augmented model out of this original model, very similar to the ones for our network. So here we start with a small model and then uh, expand it in different dimensions. Okay, we can use channel dimension, we can use the depth dimension, etc. We build an augmented model. Okay, and similar that can that principle can apply similarly to large language models by uh, increasing the number of paths or increasing the number of channels, etc. Build an augmented model, and we concatenate the base model with the augmented weights. And W base, they actually are actually shared for the red part here versus the red part here. And then we get a gradient both from the G base, gradient base versus the gradient from the augmented augmented model. Okay. And we are going to add them up all together. So this is the base supervision, this is the auxiliary uh, supervision. We added some extra supervision to the base model. A different step, we can sample different size of the network. Sometimes we sample a larger model, sometimes we sample a smaller model. What doesn't change is the inner part. We all share the same weight with the original uh, small model. And as a, as a result, we can see the learning curve for both. Here is the training, here is the accuracy, uh, the accuracy for uh, validation. Uh, not all improve the accuracy both in the training time and also the validation time, and both on the training and also the validation for the tiny model. Okay, but for the large model, it actually didn't help, but uh, hurt the accuracy. Okay, 
So for the training, it indeed helped, but for the validation, it didn't help. Meaning that the large model already has a pretty big capacity, doesn't suffer from uh, underfitting, but overfitting. What they should do is to augment the data, not augment the model, uh, which is actually echoing with our previous assumption that uh, these large models are overfitting and small models are underfitting. Uh, here we are showing uh, network augmentation is actually orthogonal to knowledge distillation. Left bar is the baseline. This is knowledge distillation. Red one is network augmentation. And this is network augmentation plus knowledge distillation working together. And also for transfer learning, uh, we compare two scenarios. One is knowledge distillation. Uh, and then another one is just training the longer, training for 4x longer. Sometimes um, the accuracy hurts using these techniques, but using natural augmentation, um, it provides a better transfer learning performance than knowledge distillation and also than 4X training schedule. So we also try to apply natural augmentation to object detection. Okay, so not only classification, but also other tasks. This is the baseline, right? X-axis is the number of max, how much compute you have, Y axis is the uh, Pascal VOC accuracy. Here is the focal accuracy. Okay, so for the same model, we can improve the accuracy, and uh, equally we can reduce the MAC if we want to achieve the same amount of accuracy. So this is the limitation here is that it only uh, explored uh, these vision tasks. It was uh, this work was done early. Uh, 2022, actually submitted in 2021 before uh, this tragedy came. So it might be very interesting to try such ideas, natural augmentation to train those small large language models. Welcome to talk to me if you're interested in that for the final product. All right, so let's have a summary of today's lecture. Um, we shifted to a new chapter about small model, okay? Apart from pruning, quantization, now we are talking about uh, knowledge distillation. We need a teacher and a student. Okay? We can match several components. We can match the final output. We can match the intermediate feature map. We can match the intermediate weight. We can also match the intermediate gradient. Not necessarily do we need a teacher model. We can also do self distillation and online distillation so that we can train only once and distill um, during this training process. Such knowledge distillation can work for many different tasks, not just classification, but also we talk about how to apply that to detection, to segmentation, to GANs, uh, to natural language processing. And also we talk about natural augmentation and orthogonal technique to improve the accuracy by augment augmenting the model. So um, in the next lecture, we'll introduce the MCU net, which is algorithm system co-design for tiny ML so that we can deploy them on microcontrollers. All right, that's all for today's lecture. Thank you.